I am very happy that today we have with us an expert. He's a development practitioner with a focus on enterprises and entrepreneurship. Um, right now we have with us Dr. P.M. Matthew. Uh, let's listen to him. Over to you, Dr. Matthew. Uh, very good morning. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mathur, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, enterprise and entrepreneurship uh, is a hot cake of the day. I mean, even globally, because uh, uh, maybe in the 70s or even uh, pre 70s, there was not much of talk about uh, small and medium enterprises. But now globally, I mean, it is at the center stage. Uh, to introduce uh, myself, I'm an economist uh, by background and uh, a development uh, practitioner by profession. Um, the difference between uh, the two things, no one is, uh, economist is well known. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the development, the practitioner, you know, one should be, um, should be clear about you know, what it is. The difference uh, between the two is um, uh, almost uh, uh, like the difference between uh, uh, the one between a scientist and a technocrat. Okay. Scientist is uh, more focused on the um, of a particular domain, but the technocrat is more interested in taking that into practice. Yeah. So, like that, uh, my role is basically of a of a practitioner, or similar to that of a technocrat. Okay. Um, my interest and forte is industry and entrepreneurship. Uh, in fact, no, as you know, this is a relatively rare interest uh, among economists in India. Um, I have the grab of a, again, uh, of a knowledge broker, which is, which is a new term in uh, much of the development discourses uh, recently, which again uh, means uh, a really rare uh, line of among professionals uh, in India. Uh, I work with uh, the Institute of uh, Small Enterprises and Development, an institute having the vision, stated vision, of uh, sustainable development through enterprise. The Institute uh, believes that the least common multiple or what you call LCM of development is the basic thing that is with every individual human being that is enterprise which essentially means that every individual has some kind of a creativity. It may vary in degrees, but the creativity of people, say by whatever name you call it, or call them, maybe an entrepreneur, maybe a farmer, maybe a businessman, maybe a craftsman, or even a student, can be an entrepreneur in the very wider uh, uh, explanation of that term. So naturally, we touch upon various uh, facets of uh, what you call development and engage in varied activities that lead to development. Because now, Development as a concept is more of an abstract thing, but then it has to be taken to the concrete uh, plane. 
So as such, uh, we are engaging in a variety of activities that lead to development. So the activities range from say research studies, advisory services, and of course, coming out from uh, research, you know, the kind of knowledge creation that takes place. And there will be some user for that somewhere. And that obviously get reflected in the form of advisory services. You no, know, there is a demand for that. And then uh, whatever knowledge that has been created, if it is remaining in the almiras, uh, it is of no use. You no, know, it has to be taken to the field. So obviously comes uh, a new area, which is called development communication, taking it to the field. And at the field level activities that straight away relate to the life and activities of all kinds of entrepreneurial minds. Doesn't mean entrepreneurs themselves, but all entrepreneurial minds. Because now, as I have already mentioned, no, I mean, every individual for that matter is an entrepreneur. In the process, we work with governments. We also work with international organizations, business associations, researchers, and the development uh, community in general. But then the question is, the whole uh, global debate and discussions about development. Okay, it is, it, it, it is taken like that. No, I mean, a lot of things are happening. Uh, maybe at the UN level down to uh, the national level, state level. But the important thing is, you know, how does it matter to the common man? Because, you know, that is uh, the ultimate thing, you know, because, uh, you know, he is the person to whom, you know, all this discussion is uh, uh, directed at. As it is well known, the concepts of uh, sustainable development, development, knowledge economy, etc., have been very popularly used today. But to the development practitioner, such questions of semantics uh, are very important as he deals with the practical aspects of it on a day-to-day -day basis. And of course, he should have the skills to take it to the context of the ultimate person that is the common man. See, I, in fact, I work with the industry, government, financial institutions, academia, and various other stakeholders who are the original sources of knowledge and stakes, you know, because stakes also are involved. You know? When it comes to development as a process, you know, there are so many of these actors coming into the picture and they have their particular stakes. So stakes are often, there's a particular nature for stakes. Stakes are often conflicting rather than converging. So every organization or a stakeholder has this particular interest you know, that will be pursued. But making a them on a convergence platform is not an easy task, but it has to happen because for the so-called development to take place, you know, it, is, it is an important thing. And this is what uh, we do and consider uh, uh, as our mission. See, the whole uh, debate today is on sustainable development because now, I mean, that is a hot cake uh, these days. Is a globi uh, globally debating point today, and the common man's language. Everybody wants development, and political parties also are after that. You no, know, they swear by the development agenda. Yeah, but then the question comes you now: What is development? Because you now the the Ahmadmi, the common man, will be asking. You no, know, I mean. All you people are talking about development, but 
we we haven't felt it like that okay so they would like to have the details of that so it begins with the very basic concept of human aspirations every human being has particular aspirations and the moment they have realized some of the aspirations new aspirations come in so this is uh, a never ending thing and such aspirations are ever increasing also so beyond the basics of survival for the individual they aspire for something like an environment or in technical jargon you know what academicians call ecosystem for growth and sustenance the first thing is sustenance and the second thing is growth but for the economist uh, he considers you know, he has a framework by his training and by his methodology background and all that he talks about the present but the whole sustainable development uh, debates and the agenda today and the there is uh, they are interested more in the process of it and they are interested more in taking that uh, that present away to the future sustainable development theory summarize this essentially with the uh, three dimensions of it and that is the difference with the uh, economic sorts is that they talk about economic aspect of it but they also add uh, two more things to it and that is the social aspect of it and the environmental aspect of it so in the whole uh, you know the early days of industrial revolution and uh, growth of capitalism uh if you ask the basic question as to what is the goal of the business obviously the entrepreneur will say that no making profit but now going beyond making profit the way the process by which profit is made it has become so important that it has now become the center stage of debates and so much so the united nations in its uh, so called brundtland report no which is 1987 yeah uh, titled uh, our common future this report brought out the guiding principles of sustainable development so it has defined it now what are the aspects of it and how that has to be taken taken for and subsequently in 2015 as we know i mean now we are talking about sustainable development goals so these goals were announced by the united nations with a target of 2030 as the cut off point and we are discussing that now among the sustainable development goals there is a significant linkage that connects several of the sdgs and more specifically goal numbers now there are 17 goals out of which goal number 8 goal number 9 and goal number 12 that are essentially addressing issues of enterprise development and the role of industry so now so much so that business and society has emerged as a focal theme today we can okay. talk about and when it comes to all international forums now the discussion is about the role of business in society but then again there is the uh, very famous quotation by economist milton friedman which friedman says that the business of business is to do business <laughs> and, and not to 
and not to do social service. Because you know, Friedman's argument is that, okay, to whom is business uh, responsible? I mean, accountable. The accountability is to the shareholders. So what does the shareholders want? Shareholders want to make profit and uh, they would like to have dividend. Okay. So if they are looking for dividend, then the people uh, who are uh, sitting in the hem of affairs in the corporation, their business is to maximize the profit and make the benefits of that to the shareholders. Now, this is another point of view. But now, universally, it is accepted that the way business is done is important, uh, just like profit is made by the corporation. Of late, India has come out with uh, its uh, CSR and responsible business policy, motored through an amendment of the Indian Companies Act in the year 2013. And subsequently, the country has also come out with uh, its voluntary guidelines. And that is specifically meant for the micro, small, and medium enterprise sector. Now, this came out in 2018. And following the prevailing uh, global thinking and guidelines as brought out by the international community, the what you call the three BL principle, uh, three bottom lines. As I already mentioned, the economic part of it the social part of it, and the environmental part of it. And all businesses, all economic activities have to meet this criteria. And if it is not met, that would mean that you know, it becomes against the interest of the society. Okay. Society in general. Now, this is the thinking now. Dr. And Matthew, this came out I'm just curious as to how your own institute's work fits into... Uh, the three sustainable development goals that you mentioned and India's policies that you have mentioned. How does your yeah. own work fit into it? I, I think it's... I straight away come to that. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the agenda has been discussed in the context of uh, SMEs as well. As such, as against the conventional thinking on entrepreneurship as a means of profit, inclusive entrepreneurship, as a comprehensive approach with the three uh, bottom line principles of profit, people, and planet has come into the uh, center stage of it. So as you rightly asked now, before coming into the institute and its role, I would like to rather say about my own personal experience and then yeah. how it comes to the okay. whole thinking about Coming to my uh, personal experience and what I learned from life uh, is uh, it is something like this, that the global thinking and the national policies and priorities obviously are more, as I, as I already mentioned, it's more abstract. You know? We talk about development and all those things. And understandable only to the researchers and uh, policy experts, and much less to the common. So I prefer to discuss such issues to the understanding of the common man, and what does it all mean to the common? And this I have uh, tried to learn and understand from my own experience. And let me come to my own personal experience to give you an indication as to how it all happens in our society, where the common man's concerns and interests get translated in the long run through a trial and error process. Such common sense questions were haunting my mind since younger days. I was born in an agrarian family of Central Tebra. Did my primary and secondary education in the 1960s in a village school 
where the facilities available, including connectivity, was minimal. My father then uh, took me to a private uh, affiliated school run by the local Christian church, where the focal thrust of the curriculum was two things those days. And one is value-based education. And number two, a rigorous coaching in English education, English language, with a significant focus on grammar. And being an average student, I got a second class in the uh, secondary school examination and became a matriculate. In the Indian conditions of primary and secondary education those days, the orientation was on two things, striving for one is the striving for academic excellence simply on the basis of aggregate marks scored in a terminal examination. And the second uh, important thing is the value education. And these were the focal thrust those days. The Kerala Education uh, Act 1958 came with educational reforms and subsequently at the policy level, as it is known to all Indians, 1966 came the Kothari Committee, which made education more broad-based and uh, inclusive. So this was a particular, obviously a particular watershed. Apart from such uh, structural changes, there was a radical change in the medium of education in favor of some kind of Anglo-Saxonization, which has resulted in the kind of uh, modern public school system now, which subsequently came up. The kind of social capital, as we talk about now, uh, was minimal those days. I mean, and hence the maximum an ordinary student could uh, dream of. And to strive for was to score good marks in the examination and maybe trying for higher studies or going just straight away going for employment, uh, seeking employment. And the bonus, if at all, was to participate in the minimum level of uh, extracurricular activities. And especially in uh, interior villages, the opportunities were much limited you know, compared to the modern days. And the goal of higher studies itself was to open those days. And even such goal setting was considered to be a privilege of students belonging to any families. And um, while higher education was considered itself, now was considered as a luxury, the ordinary students with a creditable score of Mars in the SSLC examination would straight away attempt for jobs like post office, p &D. Because you know, where they consider only really the your percentage of marks uh, in railways, etc., which those days were considered as premium jobs. So we also know uh, the, the story of uh, uh, President of India K R Narayanan, who I mean, considering you now he belongs to my own uh, district. Uh, the kind of background he was having, and those days, uh, with all the uh, adverse circumstances, uh, he could uh, manage uh, having his uh, education in UK, and that was only because of the support that was given by the Raja those days. Such a brilliant student, and his, his record stands out uh, so far. There were essentially two categories into which uh, individuals and families those days were divided. One is the, uh, the employed, you know, people having somebody, one at least one member as employed person, and those uh, in the waiting room. The employed were defined as those having government jobs, 
because private jobs those days were so rare. As such, in schools, students were identified as say some taps, no, just like the postmaster's son or the teacher's son or something like that. A few of the students had their uncles and uh, aunts uh, as teachers or as army men or something like that. I did not belong to any of these categories. Right, right. As such, in the socioeconomic strata, there were two categories of families. One, those having at least one person who is employed in government service. This is a particular category. And the other thing, all the rest, all the rest, in the sense that rest of them who were involved in all kinds of miscellaneous occupations, such as agriculture, petty trade, local crafts, and other local traditional caste-based uh, uh, occupations and professions. And besides those days, uh, caste uh, discrimination based on caste uh, itself was uh, so significant. The economic and social stratification. Now, this is this is so important. Uh, it was as follows: one, income from job versus income from property. Income from job versus income from property. Now, those having income income from job, those families. And those having some kind of property and depending upon the property. And the other category is income from large property, uh, wealthy people, and small farmers having, depending upon their uh, micro agro activities and uh, sustaining on that. And the third is income from work, either as casual labor or maybe people who are working on crafts and all that. While among the so-called redundancy, the majority of the farmers, majority were farmers, who often did not want themselves to be identified as farmers. Because you know, if you go to a household and uh, ask the head of the household, you know, what are you doing? The person will simply say, I'm, I'm not doing anything. Because you know, those days, doing something means, I mean, having a government job. And if you don't have a government job, you, know, you think that you, know, you are not doing anything. But then, if a researcher asks, you know, then how you are surviving? <laughs> He will obviously say that we are doing something and uh, doing this and that. Maybe he will not give an answer. Okay, because no, honestly, because no, they were they were thinking it like that. By all means, the dominant occupation of the village was agriculture, and the majority of households were dependent on subsistence farming. Yeah, and I belong to uh, such a family. But and Dr. Matthew, farming, can we move to the present, you know, uh, to what you are doing now? Yes, yes straight away. Straight away, come, straight away. Yeah, please. And beyond the farm income, the rich farmers gained uh, rent uh, as well. And while uh, the so-called farmers were good at farming in their own right, they were also good managers of households, able to balance their household budget efficiently. And this, what is the magic behind that? No, that is that itself was a mystery for me. The basic aspiration of such a marginal farmer was essentially to equip their children for a job. And they were having a kind of a bootstrap approach for with this particular goal and uh, were striving to uh, achieve that goal. Since jobs were so rare, though it had a market premium, and the next best alternative was to remain unemployed and to wait for an opportunity, the so-called unemployed were lacking in social recognition as well. And hence, education of children 
was considered as an investment in human capital and this is uh, this is the background and this it is from this background that i came up then came when it uh, came to higher education and uh, during that particular period we were also blessed with the government of india's three language formula which provided lot of exposure to uh, students in remote uh, states like kerala uh, to have uh, some kind of understanding of the national level situation uh, especially because of their command over uh, hindi as well as english along with the local language and um, then i moved to the college and that college also was considered to be one of the premier institutions uh, of that times and uh, after that uh, i moved to <coughs> the research career and from there begins another phase uh, of experience uh which also raises some fundamental questions as a post graduate coming from uh, out of the college i could and was uh, bound to compete in the jobs market as i told you uh, in the background like anybody else but then the question as to the availability of jobs was a turning point as the preliminaries of a career those days had to be the individual himself against the available limited options and opportunities in general though jobs were scarce the very survival of agrarian families was conditional on the equipment of the elder children of the family and hence in many families the elder children could not afford to prolong their job hunt and hence were forced to turn to the traditional family occupation that is again agriculture going back to agriculture uh the unique kind of coping system of small farmer households in central kerala instilled some kind of questions and curiosity in my mind which took me away into a career stream which to my satisfaction provided the answers and this is another uh, phase of it the two early stints in my career and that is one with uh, some uh, short term research related job at the indian institute for regional development studies in uh, central kerala uh, kottayam and the other one with the sociology anthropology center of the university of amsterdam netherlands uh, as a research associate provided me immense opportunities for a closer understanding and opportunities to investigate into the coping systems as i already mentioned in the rural economy which i have experienced and which i have closely seen both in agriculture and in the rural enterprises along with that i started my stint as a research scholar working for my phd program and grappling with the comparative uh, scene in various states and more deeply in the states of gujarat tamil nadu and kerala my broad hypothesis those days was that and this is this thinking that has come some way into the present activities as well that the difference between the rich and the poor is basically attitudinal rather than economic and this hypothesis i have tried to test and validate through my earlier research and more importantly through my interactions and discussions with uh, more than a dozen doyens in the social sciences those days 
including uh, C.T. Gurian, John Harris, Jan Brahman, Gary Rogers, Professor Lekdawala, J.C. Sandeshira, uh, Professor I.P. Deshai, A.R. Deshai, uh, people like uh, uh, Dr. Professor Dandwala, Professor M. A. Uman, and my supervisor, uh, uh, Dr. K. Matthew Kurian, and so many others. And the theoretical position of bootstrap development, that was much appealing to me because as I have seen and as I have experienced, even where against the background of all debilities, there are some households, some people, some families, they sustain themselves. But even with all the other blessings, some of the better of families don't sustain themselves like that. And there is some kind of explanation that is required. But um, first and foremost, I remain thankful to three brilliant uh, luminaries uh, of the economics discipline at the national level those days. And one was the Iti Korean. He was a brilliant teacher of economics those days. And uh, he was my mentor. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Matthew Kurian, the founder of the Kerala State Planning Board, who was my supervisor. And also Professor uh, J.C. Sandeshra of the Bombay School of Department of Economics, now the Bombay School of Public Policy. Um, a veteran uh, industrial economist of the times, having a lot of contribution to economic policy in the country. And these people have influenced me a lot. And subsequently, as a researcher at the national system of the Indian Council of uh, Social Science Research, ICSSR, I got the opportunity of expanding my canvas of comparative studies across India. And in a few of the countries, especially the UK, the Netherlands, Bangladesh, and Indonesia. And then whatever track I have uh, gone through, and this has obviously helped me in the next phase of it, in my career, and that is, some of these ideas and uh, uh, the exploration as to how these ideas can be institutionalized. And the experience, exposure, and interactions I had had uh, until 1988 equipped me with the wherewithal for visualizing and institutionalizing on the basis of broad ideas and program framework, which again goes close to the uh, idea of sustainability through enterprise. The knowledge sharing and interactions on income opportunities and coping systems at the grassroots level, of which I was part of, and which I was used to. But further elaboration, analytical understanding, and a sense of direction. As the United Nations came up with uh, its report on sustainable development, as I already mentioned, our common future in 1987. The Institute was set up in 1988. To the understanding of a few of the like-minded people on the TBL formula, as I mentioned now, the triple bottom line, they considered that the economics aspect of that, by and large, remains partial. So if it is partial, then the other two parts of it that is the social as well as 
environmental. So what will happen? On the social part, we will have a lot of social programs and there will be never ending arguments for social programs. And it is likely that you no, know, the whole development agenda will be focused on that. If we take the other part of it, that is the environmental. So it can also lead to cynical environment risk. So unless the economic part of it, and for that, a logic at the ground level is built up. Sustainable development as a concept is likely to be a difficult uh, agenda. So what is the bottom line in economic sustainability? You know, this was the question that was haunting us. In what forms can it be understood and interpreted? How could this bottom line be achieved by the common man without having a common understanding of the wherewithal that equips him to strive for such a basic minimum? Because not the ground level, unless action happens, all theoretical promises, all articulation of theory will not help. In India, the political slogan of, well-known slogan of Roti Kapda Magan. This is well-known since the beginning of the planning era. But then how could there be a market signal by which this could be made a reality for millions of people, not only in India and beyond that? To what extent people's creativity and enterprise, they can be a big connect that takes them forward. This is the question that was pondering us. Such a thinking got an institutional form and that is the present Institute of Small Enterprises and Development called ISED in 1988. Okay. The Institute, as I already mentioned, has its unique motto and credo that is sustainable development through enterprise because now the basic minimum is the creativity, the enterprise, and then work around it. Let it be whatever be the kind of uh, activities that are supportive have all those activities, take them together and instill some kind of uh, uh, morale among the people who are ready to look forward. And that is the vision and mission of the Institute. And to the Institute, every human being has an embedded creative mind, the spirit of enterprise. But then the question for the policy maker and the practitioner is to identify it and to support it. Dr. Matthew, it's can you just please wrap up in five minutes because it's been a pretty long time. Sure, sure. No, it's, it's yeah. Coming yeah. The challenge and opportunity for development policy and practice is to identify and nourish it. And to the Institute, it is the answer to the challenge posed by the three BL principle, as I already mentioned, the economic side of the development uh, triangle. And taking this idea forward from the abstract form to the concrete, it is a challenge of development policy and action. And the translation of sustainable development through enterprise demands a multifaceted uh, action and it ranges from creation of knowledge, communication of ideas of development, mentoring entrepreneurial initiatives, extending business development services, and at the more macro level, ad hoc initiatives for a constituency 
involving millions of people and their energies towards proactive development policies. In an environment of competitive politics and public policy architecture, which we are having. And having the macro umbrella of a solid conceptual framework that can provide the ideological and scientific support for people's action for survival and development is a major imperative. And that came through the dedicated knowledge hub, which is part of the Institute, the ISED Small Enterprise Observatory, which is looking at the world of small enterprises in a comprehensive manner, creates knowledge and it provides us the base for our communication program, now, which is happening at the, uh, in, in a, in a multi-state uh, manner. And then uh, the fundamental questions implicit in the vision of the Institute, it provides answers through a framework of cumulative uh, position, understanding from the common man, translating that into knowledge, paying back to him in the form of ideas and opportunities. And this is the guiding principle and methodology of activities at the Institute. So given this background of this, this gives uh, some kind of a lesson and the message that I draw from my own life and experience is that concepts and approaches such as rich, poor, development, under development, etc., are basically attitudinal. Okay. In fact, the social system running through the nation, families, and individuals in India has failed to focus on this reality and to tune the system of education and development programs accordingly. Now, this is a vital area and a missing area. Therefore, even while we speak of sustainable development, our mind is immersed in the present, whatever we say and in oneself. Capabilities then are the driving force of development where policies and programs are tuned in that direction. Sustainability obviously becomes uh, a reality. You know, it is bound to become a reality. And that is the message that is coming out. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very All much. All right, Dr. Matthews, thank you so much. I think I've really <clears throat> learned quite a lot. And your message that it's attitudinal, uh, I think, is clear and sharp that we have to also look at uh, the attitude and perhaps why it c came about in certain people. Why did this attitude come about in certain people? what you might call as deficient attitude. Why did they get the deficient attitude? I think that's a question that is worth looking at. We don't have the time here to do it, but thank you so much. I'm really glad to have you. Any final words you want to add? Yeah, in fact, uh, uh, there, is, there, is, uh, there is a lot of talk about development, there is a lot of research that is happening. Um, there is a lot of uh, things that are happening uh, as uh, uh, political agenda. Uh, but then in the ultimate analysis, uh, we as a society, uh, India with all its background and all its legacy, there's a lot of areas where 
people's initiatives uh, can make wonders and where in uh, creativity of the people no i mean uh, why the creativity of the people remain dormant that is a fundamental question and that co fundamental question need to be answered okay thank you very much uh, attitude and creativity i think these are two key issues uh, i call them as meta economic issues they are issues beyond economics but they affect economics so thank you very much for it let's end it here today and maybe we'll be back with you at some other point but let's end it here today okay everybody thank you so much i will be back with another young person or an expert and by dr matthew